Hello, everyone, and welcome to the OTC panel on ensuring a sustainable economic case for deep water. My name is Jim Kachuli, and I want to thank you for joining us today and hope that you and your families and friends are safe and well during these challenging times with COVID-19. I'd like to start by thanking the Offshore Technology Conference for organizing this panel and making it possible for us to get together using the virtual tools. I would also like to recognize the sponsoring organization for this panel, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, the Society of Petroleum Engineers, American Institute of Chemical Engineers, the Minerals, Metals and Materials Society, and the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. The oil and gas industry has faced a lot of challenges, has gone through a lot of uh, transformation in the last five years caused by the low oil price. Furthermore, COVID-19 has pushed the industry to the edge and has created new concerns and uncertainties. There are a lot of factors playing in the oil and gas industry right now. Major budget cuts by the oil and gas companies, energy transition, climate change, new technologies, digital transformation, shale, and many others. And we have a lot of questions about the impact these factors have on the future of oil and gas industry. And we hope to get some answers today. We have a great panel with a great group of industry leaders that will share their views and experiences with their own companies and provide us some insights on the future of the industry. On behalf of OTC, we are honored to have this panel today. And I want to thank all the panelists for making this event possible. This will be a roundtable discussion where the host will be asking a set of questions of the panelists. At the end of the session, if time permits, we'll try to address some questions from the audience. So please submit your questions in the chat box at any time during this session. And let, let us know, you can uh, submit comments and let us know what part of the world you're joining. We really want to hear from you and we want you to be a part of this. Without further delay, I'd like to introduce our host today, Mr. James West. Mr. West is a Senior Managing Director with Evercore and is responsible for the research coverage of the old service equipment and drilling industry for over 60 companies. Prior to joining Evercore, Mr. West was a Managing Director and Senior Research Analyst at Barclays and Lehman Brothers for about 15 years. Mr. West has been ranked number one in institutional in investor from 2013 to today. Prior to joining Lehman Brothers, uh, Mr. West worked at Donaldson, Lufkin, and Jenner. He's received his Bachelor's of Arts degree in economics and a minor in history from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. James, thank you so much for being here today, and I'll turn it over to you now to introduce the panelists and start the discussion. Thanks, Jim, and uh, welcome everyone to today's OTC Live executive panel discussion. As Jim mentioned, I'm James West, and I'll moderate today's event. I will try my best to do better than Chris Wallace in the last and perhaps only presidential debate. So if I can beat that low bar, I think I'll consider this a success. The good news is that I'm joined by a fantastic group of executives, leaders, and innovators. Our session today, as Jim mentioned, is titled Ensuring a Sustainable Economic Case for Deep Water and Incorporating Key Learnings from the Previous Cycle. We have five panelists today, and before we get started, I'd like to give each one of them a proper introduction. Joining us from BP is Starley Sykes, the Senior Vice President for the Gulf of Mexico and Canada. Prior to her current role, Starley served as VP for Offshore Global Projects and VP for Global Deepwater Projects and Projects Performance. She is Chairman of the Board of Directors of BP Exploration and Production. She's a board member of the National Ocean Industries Association and is also active in the community and serves as President of the Board of Trustees for Spindletop Charities. Starley received her Mechanical Engineering degree from Texas A&M University where she continues as a member of the university's advisory board for the engineering college and Starley and her husband live in Houston with her three sons. From Cosmos Energy, we're joined by Danny Ho. Danny served as vice president of developments for Deep Gulf Energy from 2012 to 2018 when DGD was acquired by Cosmos Energy and he continues in that role today. Cosmos, as many of you know, is a full cycle deep water independent oil and gas exploration production company focused along the Atlantic margin. Key assets include production offshore Ghana, Equatorial Guinea, and the U.S. Gulf of Mexico was world class, was also world class development offshore Mauritania and Senegal. And Danny is currently responsible for field development, design, fabrication, installation for the Gulf of Mexico. Prior to joining DG&E Cosmos and Cosmos, Danny spent eight years as vice president of production for Remington Oil and Gas and 27 years with Maxis Energy, 
working onshore and offshore production in the U.S. mid-continent, Rocky Mountains, Gulf of Mexico, Ecuador, Indonesia, and Thailand. And he holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Oklahoma. Joining us from Chevron is Mark Hatfield, Vice President of Chevron's North American Exploration and Production Company's Gulf of Mexico Business Unit, headquartered in Covington, Louisiana. Mark is responsible for Chevron's deepwater exploration and production activities in the Gulf. And Mark holds appointments with a number of industry and community partners, including the Business Council of New Orleans, Federal Reserve Energy Advisory Council, Greater New Orleans Incorporated, Louisiana Mid-Continent Oil and Gas Association, National Ocean Industries Association, and the University of Tulsa's Petroleum Engineering Advisory Board. He's also a member of the Society of Petroleum Engineers and the American Petroleum Institute. Mark joined Chevron in 1982 as a production engineer in New Orleans after graduating with a bachelor's degree in petroleum engineering from the University of Tulsa. Rounding out the oil company group today is Richard Lynch, Senior Vice President of Technology and Services for Hess. Richard is a member of the company's executive leadership team in this role. Richard is responsible for functional delivery of field development, major infrastructure drilling and completions projects, and is driving, driving functional excellence through standards, processes, technology, and talent management. Prior to joining Hess back in April 2014, Lynch spent 14 years with BP, most recently as Vice President Global Wells Organization, where he was responsible for the safe, compliant, and reliable delivery of all upstream activities associated with drilling, completions, interventions, and well bore integrity. And under Richard's leadership, the organization built the containment response system to shut in a well in the event of an uncontrollable leak, created the BP well, Global Wells Institute to develop the technical expertise of employees and contractors, and established new drilling and completion standards and policies following the Gulf of Mexico Deepwater Horizon incident. Lynch holds a bachelor's degree in petroleum engineering from the University of Wyoming. And then lastly, but certainly not least, but especially since he was the one who asked me to moderate this panel, is Blake DeBerry, the CEO of Drillquip, a designer and manufacturer of drilling and production equipment used primarily for offshore, uh, offshore wells and well suited for deep water, harsh environments and severe service applications. Blake was named CEO and a director of the company in October 2011. He joined Drillquip in 1988 and has held several management and engineering positions in the company's domestic and international offices, including a senior vice president of sales and engineering, vice president for the company's Asia Pacific region, and general manager of Drillquip Europe. Blake holds over 20 patents, and in 2015, he was awarded the Gioka Mechanical Engineering Achievement Award from the Petroleum Division of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. And this award recognizes individuals for distinguished and meritorious achievement in service in the field of petroleum mechanical engineering. Blake is a member of the Texas Tech Academy of Mechanical Engineers, and has been a member of the Texas Tech Engineering Dean's Council for more than seven, for seven years, most recently as president. In 2020, Blake was recognized as a Distinguished Engineer Award recipient by Texas Tech Whitaker College of Engineering, he holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering from Texas Tech University. So again, everyone, thanks for being here. I think we'll go ahead and get started with the, the Q&A. The first question I have uh, for all of you is, um, what has been the impact of COVID-19 on your management processes and the impacts and lessons learned from your respected companies? So if we could start with Mark, we'll go to Star Lee, then Richard, Danny, and we follow with Blake. Okay, well, uh, like everyone else, uh, we've really evolved on how our, how we manage COVID-19. Very early, we recognized how critical it was to protect our offshore workforce, knowing the environment is by design compact, which precludes easy social distancing. Initially, we had all workers fill out a questionnaire on where they had traveled, if they had symptoms or had been in contact with anyone who had traveled overseas. We also took their temperature before they traveled offshore. Those early actions certainly mitigated a lot of illness, and I'm proud that we took them when we did. However, as the pandemic spread and we got access to testing, we got much more sophisticated. We actually asked our workforce to show up early and check into a hotel where each person was tested, and only those whose tests came back negative the next day were cleared to go offshore. Uh, additionally, we moved from a 14 and 14 rotation to a 21 and 21 day rotation. Uh, and uh, a lot of times when you send people offshore, you might have people going offshore almost every day at a particular facility. We really try to mitigate that as much as possible and keep the, the crew kind of isolated from, from new people coming out. And while that certainly created a burden on our offshore crews, I can say that we're very grateful we were doing whatever possible to keep them safe. Uh, we also were performing and still are uh, advanced enhanced cleaning on all of our offshore facilities. 
with additional focus, obviously, on common spaces, door handles, handrails, et cetera. Even with all those precautions and safeguards, we have had a few outbreaks on our facilities when someone obviously passed the test but uh, contracted the virus just before the testing, I guess, when they did not have enough of the viral load. Uh, the key lesson there, as we learned, is act as soon as you can. Uh, to anyone who has symptoms, we isolate them along with those that work closely with them, get them on shore where they can seek additional medical care and quarantine. Um, as for the office-based employees, we've been working remotely since mid-March, like probably just about all of us here, which has certainly been a great way to keep everyone safe and healthy uh, as well. Back to you. Okay, well, I'll, I think I was to go next, so I'm going to jump in here. Uh, Richard Lynch here. Uh, look, on the COVID-19 front, a lot like Mark had said, uh, certainly here at Hess, and I think all the other uh, panelists here would say that, you know, the safety of our workforce and their health, as well as the service companies and all of our contractors and everyone in the communities in which we work is really our top priority. That hasn't really changed. Uh, we did stand up an enterprise-wide cross-functional team back in the middle of March. In fact, today's day 213, not that I'm counting or anything, but uh, for COVID-19. And uh, with that activation, we stood up teams in each one of our assets, whether it was in Europe, Asia, or here in the United States. Uh, all of the HES operated assets have introduced specific requirements around protocols, including health screening, testing for workers, uh, prior to departing for offshore platforms or facilities, as well as entering our onshore facilities and work sites. In addition, we've implemented travel restrictions kind of across our business. We've got remote working, and we've reduced the number of people actually working in our offshore facilities as well as our onshore sites. Most of our office-based uh, personnel, particularly here in Houston, we've not entered phase one yet, which means we're still all working remotely just like we are here today. Now we have implemented phase two reintroductions in New York City, in Colorado, and in, uh, in Denmark. So we've, uh, we've progressed phases there as we've moved along. I think uh, I've got four kind of big lessons that I've learned through this process. And I'm one of the co-leaders for COVID-19, our global response here at Hess as part of our crisis response system. First one is using your crisis response management plans are really key and critical. It was essential to get this going to, to move at pace and get the work in place that we needed to deal with a global pandemic. The next thing for me was that uh, it's it's one thing to say it, but it's another thing to actually experience. But this whole process of working remotely, I actually think is reframing potentially the way this industry works. I think there's much more to come from this and I'm really anxious to see where this is gonna lead and takes us. The next one is, uh, Benchmarking, networking, and the use of uh, professionals in this uh, space has been critically important. We have broadly benchmarked and we've networked to learn outside of our industry because when things are uncertain, the broader you have your network, the more you understand and the more you see how people are learning across the planet right now. And it's really essential to continue to keep an agile system. It is continually improving as we learn about the virus. And then probably last but not least, look, I'll just say it, social behavior in and around the communities in which we operate is one of the biggest risks that we have to manage. And it's not about anything that we can necessarily do, but it's actually about everybody in our community and how they uh, how they use the protocols and the safeguards they need to have in place. So that's a few COVID-19 comments from me. Thanks a lot. Okay, thanks, Richard and everybody. I'll, I'll come in next. I mean, there's three aspects for it for me. One's kind of the onshore or the office-based workforce. Uh, second's kind of the offshore um, workforce, which Mark touched on. And then lastly is, is kind of the approach to the community uh, and community support. So on the first one for the onshore workforce, we actually uh, fortunately or unfortunately had a bit of a dry rehearsal for this. Uh, when Harvey, when the, the storm Harvey came through Houston, our office building flooded and uh, when that occurred, we as a team had to work remotely for an extended period of time uh, until we could get alternative workspace and, and make the repairs to the building. And so, you know, that actually helped us get the protocols and, and procedures and ways of working in place uh, and ready to go. So when we had to go to remote working uh, in the office for the office teams, it was it was not a, a big deal at all. And we were able to do that kind of quickly and effectively. 
Uh, secondly, to touch on the offshore workforce, uh, again, fortunately or unfortunately, we were one of the early ones to have impacts. Uh, one of our facilities uh, had an outbreak almost immediately uh, at the time when we were starting to kind of escalate the response here in the U.S. And um, because of that, and I think because of seeing the effect on individuals, uh, we were quite uh, rigorous in our prevention schemes. We, we quickly went to 28-28 rotation from 14-14, uh, reduced work in the same way others did, and then went to a, a test, uh, actually a two-test barrier with a five-day quarantine in a hotel. And, uh, and that proved to be exceptionally uh, effective at ensuring people didn't get sick and, and ensuring that we could contain the virus and not have additional outbreaks offshore. Um, we, we are have continued to learn from our own experience through testing and through our peers, um, you know, folks like Mark and Richard and others. And, you know, we've modified those those uh, barriers as we learn more about the virus and as the testing accessibility, availability and effectiveness has increased. So uh, continuing to, to work through that and trying to find the right balance of giving our, our teams a good quality of life, but also ensuring that they don't get sick. Uh, so that, that's been our, our focus. And then lastly, just want to talk about the community. Um, been a really difficult time, I think, for, for parents in particular as their children have had to homeschool for, you know, people with aging parents that they're taking care of. And uh, we've really been active in the community, you know, donating computers, donating PPE, um, and just trying to support our teams and, and our employees with uh, the community engagement that they've, they've voluntarily done to, again, to support uh, people who are affected in very different and challenging ways by this virus. Danny, I think we'll go to you. Okay, well, I, I can basically say all of the above. I mean, we've taken the same measure. You know, we, we've closed all of our offices, and, and, and still only essential people are going into the offices. So uh, we're trying to control the spread in that manner. Uh, offshore, we've been very fortunate as a company. We've not had any uh, any positive cases. However, we are traveling to other companies' platforms, as you know, uh, Cosmos typically doesn't own the infrastructure. We will uh, tie our wells back to other floating facilities. So we're we're complying with all of their uh, requirements as far as testing and quarantine and and, uh, and our rotation. But uh, just to kind of echo what Starley was saying about uh, uh, Hurricane Harvey, you know, we, we all, our office is just down the street from BPs and uh, we all experienced the flood. And then at that time, the, the company set up everybody working remote. So we've had a lot of practice at this, and I think we've proved that uh, we're pretty good at it. You know, we're efficient. We're, we've been, been able to uh, work with each other. We miss seeing each other in the office, obviously. You know, just the ability to walk down the hall and, and uh, have a meeting and talk to somebody is, brings a lot of value. And we hope to be able to do that again here in the near future. But uh, meanwhile, like I said, we've adjusted the way we work, and, uh, and I, think, I think we've done a good job. Great. Blake? All right, I'll, I'll round it out. It's a, it's a little bit different for us as a, as a manufacturer, but also having the uh, the offshore service uh, support. So first off, uh, I, I just want to thank all of our uh, essential workers, which those are uh, the, the people running the machines, doing the welding, doing the assembly, the aftermarket group, and our offshore service technicians. They've continued to work through the downturn. Um, and I really appreciate everything uh, my fellow panelists have done to ensure that the that our our service personnel going offshore remain safe on their on their facilities. Um, you know, internally uh, for the essential workers that are coming in, we we uh, went to a multi shift uh, work schedule with no contact between shifts uh, between personnel. They uh, did a cleaning, 15 minute cleaning of the of the of their facility and their machine tools uh, at the end of the day. And, uh, you know, that, that's proved to be pretty successful. We've had a few cases, um, but but none of the cases that we've had of COVID have come within the facility. It's typically out uh, in the in the social environment. Uh, respect to the work from home. So those employees that that uh, <clears throat> can work from home, we did send them home. Um, in, in pretty quick order, our IT group did a really great job of, of getting everybody to work from home uh, that could. Um, I think I would share a lot of the uh, sentiment of, of the panel. I, there's there's pluses and minuses to work from home. That there were uh, it worked way better than I think uh, the management team thought it would do. Um, 
you know, interestingly enough, some of our employees are actually much more efficient uh, working from home um, because they don't get the, the disruptions during the day or interruptions, uh, people asking questions. But, you know, the thing that makes me always made me worry is, hey, if, if an engineer is more efficient because he's not getting interrupted, you know, is the question that somebody asking getting answered? And so um, I, I think that's a that's an element that we have to understand as we we think about what is what is the post covid work environment look like? Um, you know, collaboration. Um, there's some tools out there that's that's pretty good. It's just not as organic um, as collaborating in person. And uh, and so that's one of the things that I think we miss, particularly, um, you know, for us, we spend a lot of time, energy, effort on product development. And there's that's a big collaborative effort. Um, you know, onboarding new people is tough. And, you know, one of the things I always say is we we're really good at uh keeping the trains running on time when we're working remotely. Um, but, you know, we always want to try and get better and, and doing Kaizans, um, which are group and collaborative in nature, those are difficult. So, you know, my view is, you know, in a post COVID world, we're probably going to come back to some kind of hybrid environment where we're working um, a few days in the office and a few days at home um, that gives our employees the flexibility and then, you know, as we return to work, we're going to have to be mindful of those that have child care, schooling, um, you know, any other condition that says, hey, this is this is high risk for them. Uh, but, you know, on balance, um, it's it's been been better than expected of, of the outcome. And, and I really appreciate all Drill Clips employees worldwide uh, working hard and staying focused. Well, thanks, Blake, and, and thanks to the rest of the, the panelists. Uh, so let, let's move on a bit. Uh, in the current oil price environment and the large reduction to 2020 capital budgets, have deep water projects been pushed further to the right or are projects now being outright canceled? And Mark, I'll let you take that and Danny, I'll let you follow up. Okay, thanks. Uh, well, I think the short answer is nothing in Chevron's deep water portfolio has been canceled. However, due to market conditions, Chevron has taken steps to preserve cash, support our balance sheet strength, and preserve the long-term value. And that does include reducing our corporate-wide 2020 capital and exploratory budget by just over 20%. So uh, the good thing is the flexibility of our capital program allows us to respond to this pretty much unexpected market condition by deferring shorter cycle investments and pacing projects not yet under construction. So at the same time, we're focused on completing projects already under construction that will start up in the next few years while preserving that capability to increase the, the shorter cycle investments when prices recover. Specifically in the Gulf of Mexico, we are continuing to develop Anchor. Uh, this is a project we went to sanction on just last year, but we are uh, efficiently and strategically pacing it a little bit. Uh, we are also uh, slowing down some of our early phase projects that have not gone to sanction, but are also slowing. Um, some of the projects where we're not operator, where others are operating, uh, are taking similar action. Those projects in execution are still continuing. Nothing has been, uh, nothing has been stopped. So uh, all in all, it's, uh, it's, going, it's going pretty well. Well, at Cosmos, we took some of the same measures, obviously not to the scale of Chevron's, but uh, we reduced our budgets. We were drilling the well, uh, our second Kodiak well, in fact, and made the decision not to complete it at the time to try to preserve some, some capital. So we pushed that towards the end of this year, and we expect to be back on that well here just very soon. In, in addition to that, we delayed some of our infrastructure-led exploration, which, like all companies, you know, we, we did push our wells to the right. We didn't cancel anything. We're, we're uh, excited about our opportunities and we're taking this time to really high grade our portfolio and, and really, you know, complete the technical work to, that's required to get these drill ready uh, prospects on, on the schedule. Great, thanks. Well, so let me switch to another question along those same types of, of lines of questioning. We've had a, you know, a lot of announcements from the, you know, the, the major oil companies um, you know, that are the traditional deep water operators to shift capital to you know, alternatives, uh, renewables, things like hydrogen. Uh, is that directly removing capital from deep water operations? Does it have an impact on 
on uh, the fight for capital internally. Uh, we'll fight the deep water. Now, maybe we'll start with Mark, and then I'd like to hear from Star Lee, and then and Blake, if you could uh, chime in as well. Okay, thanks. So uh, Chevron is definitely investing in several breakthrough technologies. We've got things like ChargePoint, which is the world's largest leading right. electrical vehicle charging network, uh, carbon engineering, uh, advancing technology to remove CO2 directly from the atmosphere. However, those investments have not impacted the capital targeted for deep water. What we are working on is trying to lower the carbon intensity of our operations. And, and those metrics are actually tied to all of our executive and for that matter, all employees. And those include things like reducing methane intensity from our upstream operations, the net reduction in flaring intensity, among others. So uh, really as a, uh, as a deep water asset class, we will need to become more competitive going forward. A few ways that uh, we're working to do that is focusing on things like tiebacks, uh, utilizing existing infrastructure, finding more efficient ways to develop our prospects. And uh, just like the rest of the industry, Chevron made a lot of progress in that area that uh, we hope will continue to, uh, to attract capital towards the deep water base and the NASDAQ class. Okay, no, thanks, Mark. Great, really, really great points. I mean, I think for from my perspective, I would say a few things. One is that capital has been constrained for a while, and that's actually a, a good thing. I think when when capital is unconstrained and when we've seen the cycles go through and there have been times of very high oil price, I think we've also seen a lot of waste come into the industry and a lot of excessive spending. And, and I'm optimistic that we've got some discipline in, in place now where we can focus on you know, returning value to shareholders versus just producing more or volume. And so I think the constraint of capital in general, uh, whether it's oil price um, based or strategy, a company strategy based, or just discipline is, is a positive thing. Um, you know, BP has come out this year and announced kind of our, our new um, purpose and, and our aims uh, to reinvent BP and reimagine energy. Um, our strategy has three pillars to it. One is low carbon electricity and energy. Uh, which has a lot of the investments that, you know, things that Mark talked about, as well as, you know, heavy investments into, you know, solar, into wind, um, and into, um, you know, electric electric vehicles and, and charging. The second pillar is convenience and mobility. Uh, again, putting a, a big focus on customers and ensuring that we uh, provide the, the low carbon solutions that they need. And then the last pillar remains resilient and focused hydrocarbons and, and will for quite some time. So, um, the, the short answer is, you know, we are thinking about how to be more competitive in our hydrocarbon production, but I have not seen material uh, reductions in capital in the deep water, in particular in the Gulf of Mexico, driven by our strategy to date, and I don't anticipate it in the future. Um, the, the, the reductions we've made have been relatively moderate and have been more focused on the kind of oil price and the COVID environment. So we, we do intend to improve our carbon footprint. We are actually com absolutely committed uh, to mitigating the impacts of climate change, but we will continue to produce, again, more focused, more resilient, more efficient, and more uh, carbon-friendly um, hydrocarbons for some time to come. Thanks, Charlie. All right, James, I'll jump in here. I, certainly, uh, I'm more interested in hearing their answers than uh, providing <laughs> for the question. You know, as a, as a provider of equipment and services to support these groups, You'd have to say, uh, particularly for drill clip, we are pure play in the offshore environment. We're all in in your success in the offshore arena, and uh, and really that's that's where we have focused all our efforts. In in 2012, um, you know, we we really started investing more in our R and D programs, and and the objective there, uh, quite honestly, was to develop. Uh, equipment that structurally changed the way our customers drill wells to give them permanent cost savings. You know, I've, this is my second major downturn uh, in my career. I had the pleasure of enjoying the mid eighties downturn when I was much, much younger. And, uh, and so now we, we have something very similar to that uh, going on now. And, and the cycles and the reactions to, to those downturns are always the, you know, they're, they're pretty much the same as we, we focus on the capital spend and how do we get the spend down, um, you know, it becomes much more supply chain uh, driven environment to just get the cost down, which is totally understandable. And, and my objective was how can we somehow to a certain extent break that cycle by 
structurally changing how wells are drilled. It just, no matter what, it's permanent cost savings. Interestingly, you know, at the time we were doing that, we had a different environment. We had very high oil prices and very high costs. And, and you know, the, the view really was um, time is money. And, and it was very expensive time. Uh, that was very expensive. That time was very expensive, you know, during that time period in 2012. But as we rolled forward, um, it became apparent that as the commodity price dropped, you know, that cost structure was was even more important um, to our customer base. And that's that's really where we focused our energy um, by, you know, just trying to reimagine how things are done uh, in that offshore arena, give our customers some flexibility and and help them win that internal fight for capital and, and make deep water very productive uh for them to, to go out and do. And that's that's really been our focus. Great, thanks, Blake. Well, uh, a different type of question here um, for, for, for you guys. Has the major restructuring of the supplier group that we've seen over the last six, seven years, and I, I'm thinking things like Technip and FMC getting together, Schlumberger buying Cameron, uh, the various JVs that have been announced with some of the uh, offshore installation companies, has that enabled an improved commercial relationship uh, with the operators. Uh, maybe Danny and Charlie you can talk about from the operator side, and then Blake, I'd love to hear your thoughts as, as really an independent equipment provider. Well, I can start. Uh, I, I will say, you know, I mean, we're in deep water, right? We're, we're in some of the most innovative work that there, there is out there. Yeah. Very technical, can be very challenging, and, and frankly, we can't do it without our service customers. And the fact that the service companies are combining and coming up with some unique solutions for some of these challenges, it's, it's really been helpful to, to the companies. We don't have that capability in-house, especially for a company like Cosmos. So have, their success is really critical to our success. And, you know, it's, it's very unfortunate that slow activity has led to obviously some consolidation and, and companies are right-sizing their fleets. and. And, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to service the best they can. And, you know, it's easy for us to say we're going to delay our, our CapEx program and stuff like this. But the effect of that is obviously, you know, it's, it's very, very tough for the service companies. And uh, we're, we're trying to stay engaged with the service companies as much as we can. You know, we, we want them to be successful, you know, so that we can be too. Yeah, thanks, Danny. I'd, I'd echo your comments on the importance of the supply chain and the importance of our suppliers, um, you know, all the time. And I mean, in particular, as we try to get more efficient and, and produce things in, in, a, in a better way, uh, that collaboration and that partnership is going to be increasingly important. So, you know, while I, I want healthy suppliers that have financial strength um, and, and are efficient, I think some of the consolidation does help and, and has been beneficial in, in just suppliers being able to provide a more complete offer. Uh, we, we've seen in particular the examples you've mentioned as we partnered with with some of those larger companies, they they can take over some of the integration work uh, that we used to have to staff up and have to provide oversight to those companies and do ourselves. And, and quite frankly, they, are, they can be more efficient at, at it than, than we can. And the, the previous history of you know, layering up with the, you know, suppliers providing oversight to other suppliers and then majors providing oversight to those suppliers. We just can't afford that anymore. And we, we've got to continue to get more efficient, build more trust, uh, provide more standard solutions for simple problems, apply our engineering skills where they're needed the most, not on reinventing things that already work. And I think we can, can, can be, continue to be extremely competitive. Some of our recent tiebacks in the Gulf of Mexico that we print with have been if I'm confident I think our last Atlantis tie back was was best in class and, and we're continuing to see uh, improvements as we work again in, in support and partnership of our suppliers. Blake perhaps your perspective? Sure you know I, I, I as we as we go and round and talk to various customers of all sizes um, we find some that you know really like the, the integrated model there's some that say i use it in certain places and others not and, and some that have less interest in that um so that not a lot of commentary i can give there but um but but i can say that what we found is at the end of the day you know that the technology prevails um and and that's been that's been our focus um you know we've 
we've won uh, five Spotlight on New Technology Awards in the last four years at OTC. The most recent is our VXTE subsea tree. And, you know, we, we rolled that out. Uh, we were supposed to roll it out at OCC in 2020. Obviously, that didn't happen. So we, we did, like this panel, we, we took our OC, OTC program virtual, rolled that out to our customers. And, and you know, the, the, the whole series of e-product lines are designed to, you know, reduce your CapEx, reduce risk, reduce installation time, and, and, and hopefully make your program uh, more, more profitable, lower your break-evens. And um, and what we what we've learned is we've gotten some interest from from every spectrum of our customer base in, in those product lines, um, and and curiously some some are saying hey I want to do an internal study to see how that helps us um, and, and if it's a, a viable solution for, uh, for for improving improving our break even and others saying hey will you mind partnering with my existing tree provider, which was which was an interesting, uh, interesting perspective. And and in fact, we've actually had uh, some of the integrated players come to us and say, hey, we're interested in your technology. Is that something you would do for us? And 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 the reality from my perspective is, yeah, I mean, I want the offshore spectrum to the offshore uh, operators to be successful. And if there's a way we can contribute our technology into that into that mix and that that works for them, then, you know, we're all in in doing that. Okay, great. Well, one of the issues that reduced investment in, in deep water in the past was the stretch development cycles. And one of the major drivers of the delays was caused by a lack of collaboration with the service industry. You know, as we've had to compete with shale and other things, has the model evolved enough that improved collaboration uh, should persist? I know we've been bringing wells online a lot faster in deep water in recent years, although we haven't been that active. So uh, as we get more active, uh, can that collaboration persist? And maybe Richard, I'll, I'll have you go first, then Blake, and, and then Danny. Okay, great. Um, well, thanks, uh, thanks, James, for that. You know, uh, at Hess here, our approach has been to select and collaborate with uh, long-term partners of choice. So collaboration is critically important. And in the past 36 months, I will try to demonstrate that we've had some tremendous success in those areas. I recognize that long cycle projects offshore and in the deep water have become a little less attractive across the industry. And that's just kind of a reality statement. In some, some areas, some companies have actually shied away from them where, you know, some of the big majors, uh, some of the NOCs and some of the mid caps like Hess, we've, uh, we've certainly been engaged in the, in the deep water developments. You know, but collaboration is absolutely key, and that improves our safety, it brings our costs down, it improves our delivery to schedule, it improves the quality for a life of field asset, all of which are great things, all that we must need. And if, you, if I think about it, the words that kind of come to mind for me are simplification, it's standardization, it's common, it's the common operational philosophies that we must have. And it's actually bearing out and really sharing the lessons that we've learned from one well to the next or one activity to the next, one project to the next, really across the board. Uh, just to speak a little bit about what we've what we've seen. Uh, so in Stampede project that we delivered first oil in, um, in 2018, January 2018. That was a that was kind of a, a project that was delivered in three years. We just concluded the drilling exercise this year, and uh, you know the project was delivered uh, from a facility standpoint about six months ahead of schedule on 800 million dollars under project under projected cost in Malaysia. They're again shallower water, but a full field development there uh, come in three years from sanction as we had planned and under cost. Uh, certainly um, in in uh, I heard it mentioned there by uh, Starley, uh, tiebacks, uh, in, in fact, infrastructure-led exploration are really, really important things right now in the current environment. And just this last year, we had a, a well called ESOX that was a tieback into the Gulf Star 1 or our tubular rails field. And honestly, we went from an exploration discovery in October to a producing tieback in February of the year. And when you can do that, it changes, it really moves the needle on how you're able to form. And then maybe the last example is one from Guyana where we're partners with ExxonMobil and CNUC. And this is Lisa phase one. So Lisa phase one went from discovery 
to first oil in five years. And if you can actually do that, if you can shorten that cycle down to that amount, you can make things that are hugely beneficial to everybody that contributes or that are part of the shareholding group in a situation like that, where there's the host government, the companies involved or the public that's involved in that as well. So anyway, a few comments from me, I'll turn it over to the next guy here. Blake, you, have, you want to chime in? Uh, we recognize that shorter lead times are, are better for, for our entirety of our customer base. We've done some things internally here. Um, we are going through a, a, a lean conversion. I know, Richard, you you guys at Hess did some of that stuff in the Bakken and had, had good success. We've seen good success here. Um, and then you know, we know that, that where there's a standard that our customers can agree on, we're happy to invest counter cyclically and have inventory on the ground that allows allows you to respond quickly, um, particularly if you have a, a, a tieback scenario. Um, and, you know, we one of the things I find interesting, and James, you're probably not going to like this, but remember I did invite you to host, is one, one of your competitors wrote a paper a while back called uh, A Deep Dive into Deepwater Economics. And, um, and what was interesting in that paper was the value proposition between time saved and capital spent. And, and the, the short story of, of, of the conclusion is that a 10% reduction in capital or a 10% reduction in development time mm -hmm. end up having the same effect on break even. So if you can reduce your capital and reduce your overall uh, development time, you can get a, a compounding effect basically in, in your IRR or, or your break even point. And, and that's one of the things that, that I think is is really struck home for me, um, particularly with VXTE, when we're talking about, look, I got a, that whole product is, um, I can land the tubing hanger without regard to orientation in the wellhead, which means we can now drill the well through to completion, right? We don't have to pull a BOP and saw a tubing spool. We don't have to have a rig that's been surveyed so we can orient the tubing hanger. And then we can come back later and land the tree at, at, at any orientation that is desired by the operator. And, and it's, you know, to me that that's going to open up a lot of opportunities to kind of rethink wealth, wealth sequencing um, as we, as we drill these fields uh, going forward. And the last point I really have, and, and this is more on the collaboration side, I've, I've been at drill quip about 32 years now. When I, when I hired on here, we were a private company, um, had three, a total of three product lines, we have about 18 products um, now, uh, and I've spent my entire career getting somebody to run serial number one. That's been a lot of what I've done, um, you know, and, and I think that's an area, at least from my perspective, that collaboration with the operators would be helpful. Um, you know, I, I remember in my early days, somebody uh, talking about one particular officer, they, they're they very proud of the fact that they're going to be the first to be second, you know, and, and so, um, I think if we could get some collaboration on, hey, here's some great technology and how do we how do we get this in the field and get it run and get some confidence that that uh, the entire sector can then benefit from that improved technology. Danny, you want to wrap us up? Yeah, I'll, I'll go back to talking, talking about the infrastructure that exploration and Richard brought up. And, and that's that's really what Cosmos uh, specializes in. And, you know, we'll, we'll drill our wells as close to existing infrastructure as possible so we can utilize. You know, one thing about it, the Gulf of Mexico is you'll see that there's very few facilities that are running at 100% of their nameplate capacity. So there's a lot of opportunity for us to tie back to those facilities. And, it, and when we're doing those tiebacks, you know, our experience has been a year to 18 months. It's our cycle time. Well, if you couple that with obviously not having to invest in that major infrastructure, the billion dollar facilities, and then you cut that cycle time from three to five years down to a year to a year and a half, economics start looking a whole lot better. And, and in this oil price environment, that may be the only thing we can do at this time. So we're, we're looking forward to continuing that, that work. Because well, great. Well, what we do. another question along those lines a bit, how much has the faster drilling times with some of these seventh generation drill ships improved the economics? And, and what about equipment standardization? And maybe, on the standardization topic, especially Blake, maybe you could start there and then I'll hand it to Mark and then to Starley. That's one of the, the key focuses we have right now. You know, when we, 
when we look across our portfolio, and let's just take one product line, subsea wellheads, which is which is a pretty substantial product for us. Uh, we have 14 different versions of subsea wellhead that we sell globally, right? And that's just a lot of SKUs to uh, to manage and maintain. Um, takes engineering personnel to 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 follow up with all that. It's a lot of inventory. And, and we've gone through and rationalized that. And, and we can we actually believe just internally, we can take 14 systems, convert them down to four and fulfill all of uh, all of our customer requirements. Um, you know, many of our customers have different specifications, different levels. Um, North Sea has different requirements than Asia has different requirements in the Gulf of Mexico. But we think with four products, we can get there. That said, um, we will never not make a special for a customer, but I think going forward, what we're going to find out is these are the four that you have an option uh, uh, to buy. If if you want something different, we're happy to do it for you, but it comes at a, at a price and probably with a longer lead time just to, because if we can condense down to four, we just have better inventory control, better cost containment on, on our side. And Mark? Yeah, so uh, I think Blake set the stage really well on standardization. Um, internally, we're using design one, build many approach to gain synergies and lower our costs. We're also participate in uh, joint industry efforts to standardize deep water equipment uh, with the goal of driving down those costs. Um, you know, that, 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 that standardization is part of it, but also just, uh, you know, a lot of what I'll call standardization in, in just the drilling side itself with faster drilling times. Uh, uh, faster drilling times have been a game changer for Chevron and I'm sure the entire industry, as much of the cost of finding and developing is well cost. And, and these costs are largely based on the fixed daily costs you have on a rig. So reducing the field time has been a key enabler to lower costs and, and lower the break even, which is crucial in competing for capital in this lower price environment we're in. Uh, you know, and so, you know, in the Gulf of Mexico, I'll give an example, we've reduced our, our drilling completion days for 10,000 feet by over 40% just in the last several years. I, I credit the ingenuity of our technical teams in making this happen. Uh, we've gone from uh, early on kind of a, a goal just to get the wells down as they are very complex. And uh, actually, I'm still in awe of the technology and the know-how to make that happen. Of course, as an industry, we proved that we could do that. Now the focus is uh, quickly shifted to how do we get more efficient with it in a lower price environment? And that sort of sense of urgency is very high. So a key component of that is standardization. Uh, standardization in well design, standardization in the equipment that Blake was talking about. and. Uh, um, that really, that's got to happen for deep water projects to lower the costs and the cycle time for that matter. And uh, to get there, we're all going to have to work pretty closely together. Yeah, I've been great. Yeah, great comments from, from Blake and Mark. And, and I really appreciate Blake's perspective from a supplier because I think um, if you go back to the early days or earlier days of deep water, you know, the, the cost of failure is so high uh, that I think we tended to, to over-engineer things, again, just as Mark said, to get the well down with kind of the um, the objective to get the well, well down safely. And um, I think as we've matured and, and evolved, um, you know, I think we've realized that actually, you know, you can do things in a more standard way. And we appreciate the push from suppliers to, to kind of manage their product lines and, and, and to get to a place where they're you know, selling us a efficient to produced standard solution that's that's more cost effective and will will do the job safely. And, that, and that's really kind of all you need uh, for the majority of these these projects and this work. So, you know, support the comments on, you know, the goal is to, to have, you know, lower cost. Tie backs, I think it's obviously different than the, you know, the wells, the drilling, uh, the floating structure and then the subsea infrastructure, anything we can do to, to reduce those costs makes a big difference. I think we were in a period of very high rig rates that um, we, we've kind of managed to, to get past. And um, and now that we're getting kind of more effective, uh, more um, you know efficient, uh, better rig contracts in place, and that combination with um, you know lower uh, or faster drill times is allowing us to com uh, drill complete wells at a fraction of the cost that we did kind of five to 10 years ago. So, you know, really appreciative of the partnership with our suppliers to, to manage that. And so 
What are some of the, or what are the key technologies that have likely sustainably lowered parts of the cost curve for deep water? Maybe Richard, if you could hit that first, then Star Lee, and then Flake, if you could uh, wrap it up. And I, I'm going to kind of start off with a theme that was kind of part of the last question, because I, I mean, when you think about a deep water development, you do have to kind of follow the money. And of course, the drilling completion, the well delivery element of the project is really a, a dominant, usually in most most all deep water development. So certainly that is one and certainly deep, deep water drilling and completion costs have decreased significantly over the last five to six years. A lot of that is technology based. You know, technology continues to drive down the overall costs, and it's using both the high specification deep water rigs, which you've already heard the guys and, and, and Charlie talk about a little bit, but importantly, automation and high reliability well bore components are essential to this as well, because there's nothing like infant mortality in a deep water well that can really uh, take a, a great project to its needs very quickly. And then not but last, not least, but there's also fit for purpose deep water interventional vessels that we're all starting to use now. And it's really essential to kind of be able to do that, that work over or one of those small tweaks in the well bore that's required in the life of field that makes a total difference. Um, as well as being able to stimulate the well bores and then ultimately inspect the full facility, whether it's surf, the top sides of the wells themselves. You know, I think that technology is going to be needed for structural and a step change in our business in the deep water. So we're just beginning this journey in my in my mind. You know, technology drove the shell revolution. If you think about the combination of fracture stimulation and long reach directional wells. And if we have that same kind of thinking that will unlock the deep water, we're going to be in a much, much better place. And of course, that then allows for lean and other types of techniques to be used to really drive standard work in a deep water world, which we've all talked about here in the last few comments. You know, I think that the uh, the world of smart machinery, cloud-based solutions, digital analytics in a way that we've never been able to tie systems together before, and then revolutionary corrosion preventative methods, whether it's in piping or fouling or scaling or whatever, will change the world for us. And, and look, I'm not only talking about capital costs now, but importantly talking about operating expenses as well. And actually as we connect our people to the data and we can actually engage our subject matter experts directly, the technology just blossoms into great things for us. And it's really important for our deep water world in our future. So I'll, I'll leave that for, uh, for the next to take it and go from there, go ahead. No, that was, that was great, Richard. I, I thought, similar to you, I'll kind of look forward. I think if you look back, there's there's lots of examples of things that people have done or innovations that have been made that have improved the you know the quality and the cost of our developments. But if I look forward, I think there's a few things that are going to make a big uh, impact and be and be um, needed in the future. The first one you can Richard touched on is automation and um, you know doing things in a, in a less manual way. I think anything we can do to um, you know, remove the people from having to work offshore and to do things in a more remote and automated way is is better and safer uh, for, for people. I think decommissioning and, and kind of understanding the integrity of our facilities is going to be really important. So, you know, drones, uh, drones, inspection, crawlers, um, advanced imaging to, again, understand the, the current health and state of our facilities. As Danny mentioned, a lot of them aren't full. And, and if we could, you know, again, take care of those facilities and help them um, you know, be safe and reliable longer and increase the distance of the subsea tiebacks, you know, that, that could continue to, to make a, an impact and allow us to produce a cost-effective uh, oil and gas for the, for the country for a long time to come. I think power needs to be a big consideration. Uh, in particular, when you look at kind of carbon emissions, you know, a lot of the emissions in, in the offshore come from, uh, the first is flaring, uh, the second is logistics. Uh, but actually the, the biggest uh, contribution to carbon emissions is, is the power generation that we need um, to, to power our facilities and to power the, the secondary recovery, things like water injection. And if we can find a way to do that more efficiently or with low carbon power, uh, even from you know hubs or, or onshore, that could be a, a real game changer. Right. All right, so I'll, I'll step in here, and and my focus is a little more narrow since uh, since I'm, I'm on the equipment side. But uh, but I, I was pleased to hear you both talk about removing personnel from the rig. 
um, and, and automation. You know, one, one of the things that uh, one of the products we come out with, we call Badger and it's a 22 inch uh, pipe connector, but it can be made up remotely. You know, the, the anti-rotation keys are included into the connector. So you literally can have a camera there, observe torque, visual makeup. And, and, and that was the whole intent was pulling people off the rig from, um, you know, a cost, but more importantly, an HSE perspective. Um, and, and then, you know, the focus on that whole E-series of products, you know, just mitigating risk, um, whether it's, you know, I don't have to run lockdown sleeves in the big bore 2E or, or giving you some flexibility in, in on, on VXT of, of how we, uh, how you plan and drill the well to, to minimize the amount of time that the, you know, you have the full spread out in the field during the development operation or give you the flexibility, our XPAC DE expandable liner hanger down into the 18 inch and 20 inch sub mud line. Um, it gives you optionality that you can run it or not uh, as the well, as the well requires. So, you know, I think, um, you know, that all of those things are, are important. And, uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that, that, you know, we're, we're going to be helpful to, to our customer base to, uh, to be successful, you know, as we continue down the road. You know, and James, I'd like to make just one more point. Sure. Like you reminded me of something that I didn't say, and I should have uh, should have mentioned it. And and I'll do this for all the subsurface people that might be watching. Seismic imaging and the advancement of seismic imaging is so critical to the deep water world, and we're seeing remarkable breakthroughs right now. But the more and more we're getting into the data analytics and the automation of those processes and procedures, as well as getting deeper into the data that's represented and applying these new concepts, the imaging that's coming from that is remarkable. And I and I actually think it is a uh, we know big fields get bigger. We've never understood that. Well, we're starting to start to understand that now. And I'm really looking forward to what that means in the deep water. It applies equally in the unconventionals as well, but for predominantly in the deep water, it's a critical technology going forward for us. Sam, thanks for letting me jump in there, James. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, no, we, we agree, definitely. Um, so in the internal fight for, for capital, can deep water returns continue to outperform shale or unconventionals when cost inflation returns? And Marco, uh, maybe you could start there, and Richard, you could follow up. Okay, James. So well, as I mentioned earlier, Chevron has a diverse portfolio of asset classes, which balances short and longer term projects. So uh, in short, we're happy with our large position in the shale asset class, and we're happy with a great position mm -hmm. in the deep water, among others in our portfolio. Um, and so, you know, at Chevron, like anywhere else, we're going to invest in the best projects. And in the Gulf of Mexico, we've going to have to continue to drive our costs down and get more efficient uh, in order to compete in uh, for capital and, and resources in that upstream portfolio. You know, all in all, deep water is a large competitive resource uh, and it, it basically unlocks material value through greater efficiencies and uh, some of that new technology that we talked about earlier. Uh, when I think about the success of like the lower tertiary, particularly with projects like uh, uh, Jack St. Malo with Chevron operating in the, in the deep water. We continue to see this asset class as successful and competitive uh, as a great business opportunity for us in the, in the short term and the long term. You know, in recent years, we, we've had a lot of technological breakthroughs that have really opened up some new, new opportunities for us. Uh, now accessing higher pressure, higher temperature reservoirs, um, you know, to summarize, I think it's important to have more than one asset class in your portfolio and a strength of Chevron. Of course, that only works if we can prove that the cost to find, develop and operate sum up to make that investment competitive and worthwhile. So, so many of the concepts already brought up by this panel group uh, will certainly are needed to make that happen, especially in the environment we're in today. Right. Richard? Yeah. Well, looks like, Mark, we're talking out of the same book here. So I'm going to make a few comments that are going to resonate with yours. Look, we're involved in the deep water. We're also very involved in the unconventionals. A lot smaller player than, than Chevron is, Mark, than Mark uh, is the only difference. But look, economic fundamentals need to drive your investment. And then both on, offshore and onshore can be commercially attractive. And when we look at the break-even costs in the top 50 offshore 
developments and in the shell plays, you'll note that the offshore projects are about over 50% of those, of those overall top 50. And I just want to make a case in point with this. And I'm going to use Guyana. Cortez is a partner with ExxonMobil and in, Sinook in, in Guyana. Well, Guyana is very unique. And it's really about the quality of the reservoir, the quality of the development that you have in, in your hands. And in Guyana, our phase one development, uh, it's uh, on a boat called Destiny, come in at about $35 a barrel break even. Phase two, which is called Unity, and laser phase two is called Unity, and it come in at about $25 a barrel. And we've just sanctioned uh, on September 30th, 13 days ago, the third major FPSO development in Guyana, and it's called uh, Pyara, and Pyara come in at about $32 a barrel. So even though I can sit here and talk to you about Bakken numbers and Bakken break-evens, I'm here to tell you when you can hit those kind of numbers in the deep water, Things are real, and you can go forward with projects of that nature. So that's my can, my remarks. Thanks for letting me speak. Absolutely. Well, you know, investors have a lot of fears these days with respect to oil and gas companies uh, because of the talk about the energy transition, climate change. Um, should these be considerations for capital allocation into deep water? And maybe Star Lee, if you could start, because obviously BP has made some big statements about this, and then. Richard, I'd love to hear your thoughts, and then Blake, uh, yours as well. Yeah, no, thanks, James. And it, it won't surprise you, but um, you know, I, I absolutely think they should be considerations, and you know, we need to listen to our investors and, and understand what their concerns are. And um, a lot, increasingly, more and more of our investors, uh, and these are mainstream investors as well as those that focus on ESG, are are concerned about the environment and concerned about the impact that our industry has on it. And, and we believe in MVP, and I believe that. You know, a big part of the solution is 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 our is companies like BP, you know, leaning into the transition and looking for ways to provide energy in a more sustainable way uh, than perhaps we have in the past. So, uh, I think we absolutely need to listen to our investors, and I think there are some very very creative and interesting uh, ideas out there that are uh, ways that we can produce energy, including hydrocarbons, in a much more efficient and carbon uh, climate friendly way. And we need to listen to those and and, and take action on it. And the last thing I'd say on investors is while they absolutely do want us to do what's best for the environment and for the climate, they are interested in returns and they are interested in cash. And so we need to do things that are good for the environment and good for the climate, but also are you know smart business decisions. And then you know we we care about both. And and again, I think there are opportunities that will allow us to deliver both more responsible uh, production, but also better returns and and, and cash to our investors. Richard. Yeah, I'll go ahead and pick up from there. And, and Charlie, I couldn't agree more. And, and kind of as I just previously stated, economics will drive investment and resource allocation as they always have, and they will continue to do that. In the long term, we all need to recognize that oil and gas demand is increasing, actually. So, I mean, that's just a fact. You know, the IEA, uh, which when you look at their most conservative forecast, they see that oil and gas is making up some 40% of the total energy demand over the next several decades. Investment in all sectors, including deep water, will be absolutely critical. When you look at the IEA data, they, you know, they put an estimate out there that says it'd be $540 billion required every year to the year 2040 investment requirement. That is more, when you sum it all up, that's $12 trillion investment of which $6 trillion will be will be pushed or funneled towards the offshore deep water environments. So it's really important. Now, I, I know that there's an IEA information that literally just came out right before this uh, this mm -hmm. uh, program. And I, you know, the quick snap for me on that one was a quick peek was, it looks like they're showing now a slower recovery for it. So, I mean, they're saying now not till 2025. So that actually just puts more pressure on the investment for the longer term future. So uh, I'll turn it over to Blake from there. Thanks. Thanks, Starley, for your comments. Yeah, Starley, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. I, look, when I when I think <clears throat> about uh, ESG issues, we get the same uh, pressures from our shareholders. It's probably a, a, a different take, but the, you know they want to see that we're doing everything we can to do to mitigate uh, our carbon footprint as we go through and do what we do. But you know, my my view is that oil and gas has been incredibly beneficial to humankind. <laughs> I mean, brought 
countries and people out of poverty, cheap, affordable, reliable energy is, is paramount um, to human flourishing, right? That's just the reality. I think oil and gas is going to be here for some years to come as we transition. And, and so I don't like to get into debates about climate change and all that, because quite honestly, I'm just not smart enough to debate that. But if we believe CO2 is, is, is not good in the environment, then what we need to do as companies and business leaders is do everything in our power to minimize the, the carbon footprint of our activities. And, and really, it's been, uh, it's, it's been an interesting offshoot of our R&D programs, right? If, if we can avoid installing 40 tons worth of hardware, that's 40 tons worth of finished steel, which was probably 50 tons to start with that we didn't have to make. And one of the interesting things I've learned about steel is for every ton of steel, you put two tons of CO2 in the air to get it manufactured, right? And so, you know, that's 100 tons of CO2 just because we didn't install something, right? And, and then you start thinking about how much energy do we burn to finish it, make it, fabricate it, deliver it on right. site the day spent, um, how many days did we spend uh, installing it with that spread? Um, you know, I, I think we could probably do a better job of, of starting to capture that and report that back. And certainly that's that's what we're doing as part of our ESG efforts here is to let our shareholders know that we are doing things that reduce our carbon footprint in order to get this critical resource that helps people, uh, help, helps people's lives and, 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 um, and saves people's lives, quite frankly. Right. Well, thank you, Blake. So, uh, last question for me, and then we can turn it over to the, the audience. I've already kept you guys for, for over an hour now. So, uh, I, I recognize, uh, I'm probably over my allotted time, but I'm curious, you know, we've seen some huge efficiency gains, uh, in shale. Uh, are those gains and those learnings translating into deep water? And Richard, maybe I'll start with you and then go to Mark and then Starley, if you could, if you could finish up. Yeah, well, you know, yeah, great, uh, great question. Uh, James, absolutely. I mean, the U.S. shell development has impacted the entire industry, actually imp impacted the entire world. And it's actually changed it, I would believe, forever. You know, that's around technology. Technology opened and transformed the unconventional place. It's got every room to work that same way in the, uh, in the deep water. Companies have always favored smaller, nimbler, short cycle projects. We've already talked a little bit about that, uh, you know, Danny and myself about how infrastructure led uh, elements are really essential and longer distance tiebacks will be a big part of that going forward into our future. The, uh, the application of lean manufacturing techniques, certainly we've seen the huge benefits of that it has in our Bakken field. And look, it, it, is, it, is, it is about removal of waste. It is about an army of problem solvers. It is about actually gaining performance on a continuous basis. It's not about trying to achieve the first quartile. It's about redefining the first quartile continuously. And when you can get into that rhythm, it changes the world that you're in. So, you know, bringing that forward into the deep water, I think is essential for all of us to do. And I know many of us are, are, are doing that. Many of us are, uh, are learning more about it. But as we get more simplified and more standardized across our businesses and between the companies, actually, the better off we'll all be in simplifying and just making it, it work for us in a lean sense. So anyway, a few of my comments, I'm happy now to turn it back to, uh, I guess Mark was going to go next. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, thanks. And, uh, and I think you summed it up extremely well. Um, I, you know, for a long time, many of us, uh, I don't think, I, I think we had this uh, thought that we couldn't learn from other asset classes. We had this, uh, we are a different, mindset. And uh, I think today we've all learned that uh, sharing across asset classes has been a key to drive uh, efficiencies. When I look at the factory model used in the Permian Basin and what they've, what they've achieved with that, demonstrated the benefits of standardization, which we talked about earlier. And I think we had broad consensus that that is a huge game changer for both the unconventional and deep water asset class. Uh, as I mentioned, the Gulf of Mexico, we're using a design one build mini approach to gain efficiencies and lower our costs. 
Uh, we've also followed in our colleagues' footsteps, increasing the frequency of looking what others are doing, not just in uh, other asset classes, but right here in, uh, in our own asset class, just uh, across, uh, across different companies. You know, at, at the end of the day, uh, it's really easy to drop into what I'll call an inward looking business and trying to figure it out all by ourselves. And we all know that we have some great ideas and a lot of smart people, but other companies have uh, also a lot of great ideas with a lot of smart people. And I think we've gotten a lot better job at collaborating and sharing ideas and be willing to adopt other people's good ideas. And this this all also helps set our cost targets that, that he just previously mentioned and, and kind of more of those bold ambitions. Uh, additionally, inside at Chevron, we're also going a bit more formal on how we share and adopt our learnings from different uh, deep water basins around the world. Uh, we've got several, uh, several basins around the globe where we have deep water uh, opportunities and we've been a lot more intentional now about collaborating there and sharing lessons learned, uh, which again is, is I think the key to driving our costs down and, and some of the earlier things that we were talking about is how to compete in a lower price environment and uh, it's all hands on deck there. Right. Thanks, Mark. And then, yeah, great comments, Mark and, and Richard. And I, I think there's absolutely a lot to be learned from, from the onshore. Uh, and I think we have learned and continue to learn. And it's, it's, you know, lean techniques like Richard talked about, you know, we're, we're going big on agile and, and agile methods to, to manage kind of workflows and, and finding that to be helpful and effective. I was really glad Richard mentioned seismic earlier. I was remiss in not talking about it uh, earlier because it's 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 a game changer again, in particular for the deep water. And I think it's not only the technology around the image, but also the processing technology, and and learning how we can do that uh, using agile methods and, and other methods to to decrease the cycle time, and you know get a an image quicker uh, to let us know whether or not we should continue to work on prospects is is really helpful. I think there's also uh, things to learn on the on the drilling side. You know, we don't use horizontal wells as often in the deep water. Uh, if we could use some of that technology uh, in, in a better way, you know, that could make a difference on our on the productivity of our wells. And then, lastly, I think there's something in in tertiary recovery uh, around uh, enhanced oil production using CO2. Uh, we've got some concepts we're thinking about where you know, if you can inject carbon into these giant deep water reservoirs, you know, think what that could do for helping the environment while also, you know, being more efficient in oil production. So I think there's a lot out there to learn. Well, great. Well, look, uh, before we, I sign off here, I want to just let everybody know in the audience, uh, if you want to ask a, a question, please put your question in the comments box and uh, Jim's going to manage the audience Q and A, but Mark, Starley, Richard, Danny, Blake, thanks so much for, for entertaining my questions uh, today. I really enjoyed it. Great commentary, great insight, and thanks so much. And I'll turn it over to Jim. Thank you, James. We can't hear you, Jim. All right. Uh, thanks, James. I appreciate it, uh, your efforts here. A great discussion, great question. So as James said, we're going to turn it to the audience right now. Uh, so again, please put your question in the chat box. We already have a few questions, so I'm going to start. Uh, the first question is uh, directed to Danny and Starley. Uh, could you please uh, comment more on the long, uh, long distance tiebacks and related new technologies? Yeah, I'll be glad to jump on that first. Really, uh, the biggest part of my job is really the design and installation of the tiebacks. So, uh, you know, for me, uh, flow assurance obviously is very critical and when you get flow lines that are 20 and 30 miles long you've got to have some very efficient insulating systems and i think that technology has come a long ways uh your our pipe and pipe systems are far more efficient than they used to be and also we have electric heating now i think you will see that being utilized a lot more in the gulf of mexico in addition to that i think uh, these multi-phase pumps are, are really going to be critical and, and we're starting to see the use of those pumps a lot a lot more widespread in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, you know, lower abandonment pressure obviously means a lot. When you're eight to 10,000 feet of water, that, that's very critical to the economics of the well and, and keeping the well producing at high enough rates to make it economical and to keep our facilities full. So I, I think that those are the two leading technologies for uh, long tiebacks. Yeah. 
Thanks, Danny. I, I agree with your comments, unsurprisingly. But I, you know, I think it's if you think about kind of what what enables the technology, the first and foremost is flow assurance. So it's anything that can allow you to produce, you know, the oil and gas uh, at a longer distance uh, without kind of creating and other problems that are that are common in deep water facilities. So you know, ways to take care of the fluids and, and mitigate the flow assurance concerns. I absolutely agree with pumping and, and, and processing as, as well as enablers. You know, I think if we can move some of the equipment that we have on the on the top sides to subsea, uh, you know, that could, could be a, a game changer as well. I mentioned earlier, um, you know, power and, and different ways to get power. I think that's important too. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, uh, Starley and Danny. Uh, the next question is for uh, Blake DeBerry. How is the implementation of R&D helping your company? I appreciate some more information on it. Uh, Blake, you're on mute. See, sorry about that. Hey, uh, so when uh, when I became CEO in uh, 2000, October of 2011, you know, one of the things I did was sit down and say, okay, now what, right? Uh, here's this company I've been working at for 20 plus years. And, and one of the things I did was look at where, what products are we really successful on where we have, you know, respectful market, respectable market shares and where do we have, you know, just a, a modest market share. And, and then why is that between those two, between those two products? And, and it became pretty clear that, um, where that product had some differentiating technology was where we were successful. If, if we had a me too product, um, we had, we had modest market share in that, in that product range. And so it, it really drove me to the decision that we must invest heavily in our R and D programs. And you have to realize, particularly for drill clip, you know, our size compared to our peer group, we are, we are the smallest uh, player out there. And so, you know, we, you know, my view is we, we, we need a better mousetrap, so to speak. That's the, the, the simple answer. And so um, uh, we embarked on that, that exercise and, and that, that has shown to be a positive outcome, right? I mean, we have much more traction <clears throat> in our new products that are differentiated than, than something that was similar to that, but, but didn't have that differentiated element in it. And so that's, that's really the big driver. I think it's key to drill quip success. Um, you know, we're, we're very focused on the R and D. We have a significant R and D roadmap. You know, we've done, you know, I talked about these five products that we did, uh, you know, the kind of in this E series um, of products, but you know, there's more products to come uh, down the road. We're continuing that R and D effort. So it is a significant element to the success of the company. Thanks, Blake. Uh, another question, and this this can be for any of the panelists that would like to answer. Can you share something about digitalization, big data efforts within your companies and how these activities are adding value to your organization? Yeah, I, I can go. Um, so this is, a, this is a big focus for us. Um, and, and I think it probably is for all of the, the, the panelists. Um, you know, I think we found that there's a, an infinite amount of data generated in our um, industry that we just don't don't use. Uh, we don't have the capacity to use. So as we look at digitization, you know, we, we are um, trying to make better use of that data. And the first thing to do is to, you know, actually um, make it usable. And so we have a number of projects that are looking at everything from, you know, reliability um, data on our on our systems and on our um, equipment. Uh, I mentioned seismic earlier, seismic processing. We, we do quite a bit of actually internal uh, work on seismic processing. Uh, we have a high performance computing center in Houston that we, we use to, to also help us with some of these activities. And just with the, the recent kind of reinvent VP um, announcement, increase the, the number leadership position the size of our digital organization while the company. So it's it's a big focus for us. We, you know, as far as success that we can talk about to date, um, it's things around kind of the integrity of our our systems um, and our facilities. It's around reliability and performance of our equipment. And it's around kind of the, the subsurface, um, both imaging uh, as well as you know production optimization. I, I could Great. go ahead and add some stuff uh, to what Starley just said. I agree hundred percent of what she just mentioned. I think a couple of years ago, there was an acknowledgement inside of Chevron that uh, 
that Chevron and probably really the entire industry was a bit behind on the digital front uh, relative to a lot of other industries. And so we, uh, we tried to up our game in that space, just like uh, a lot of the other companies have inside of the oil and gas um, to the benefit. Um, in the lower price environment, we're still there. We're still very committed, but we're also making sure that we're cost effective in what we do and how we think about that. Uh, the, the big data that Starley talked about is crucial for us. Uh, I think she summed it up really well. We, 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 uh, we're capable of generating a lot of data. And now the, uh, the, the key to unlock the door really is about uh, what do you do with that data? How do you manage it? And how do you, how do you use that data to your benefit to get a, a safer, more efficient operation? Great. Uh, thanks, Sali, and thanks, Mark. Uh, that's that's really interesting topic for the oil and gas, and I'm glad that uh, the majors are are jumping into it. I, I want to share some information. There's quite a bit of effort in the industry. Uh, American Society of Mechanical Engineers being one of them in standards development, uh, which I think we we lack. So there's quite a bit of effort on the oil and gas industry. Uh, that's just it's good. It's going to help us all. Uh, another question, uh, there's a question for, for Hess, for Richard. Uh, can you explain why uh, Payara break-even is increased compared to Lisa phase two uh, to the extent that you can talk about it, but the question is there. Yeah, no, I'll put it, it's, it's quite simple, actually. I'll put it in real simple terms. Um, first, the aerial extent of the reservoir, the reservoirs is much larger. And then the second piece of that, there's less stacking of the reservoirs as well in that particular area. So consequently, we end up with like 145 kilometers of flow lines in one area versus 80 in the other. Also, because of that, your well count goes up considerably. So we've got kind of like 41 wells in the Pyara versus some 30 wells in the uh, in the phase two area. So. It, it, it comes down to just simple math. We've just got a lot more spread and a lot more well density in one project versus the other one. Essentially, the top sides are, are you know, are the same. Build one and or design one and build uh, several of these. So uh, it's really about to subsea the surf and the wells. Okay, great. Thanks, thanks, Richard. Uh, another question is: Can you comment on how new technologies can provide benefit to offshore? deep water safety measures and anybody that can chime in, I appreciate. Well, I've got a recent example uh, just here at Chevron with, uh, and a lot of what we talked about earlier with, uh, especially in the COVID world, we're trying to minimize people going offshore and only having the critical force uh, out there just to minimize the, uh, the, the social spread. Um, and so what we started doing is uh, having some of our, uh, our safety and environmental audits performed remotely, just using technology. So we've, uh, we've introduced HoloLens technology, for example, to where uh, not just in a safety or environmental audit, but maybe having a, a compressor specialist onshore being able to help diagnose an issue offshore uh, just by having a, an offshore worker Put on the put on the hollow lens and uh, and it's just like the uh, the subject matter expert was right there beside them and so uh, that that is a great example of using technology to our benefit uh, to minimize travel and minimize safety exposure and minimize everything else uh, and and to lower our costs which again it's kind of a redundant theme here anything we can do to reduce our costs and get more efficient and more timely and reduce the cycle time of any equipment down or, or help our, our offshore workforce be as safe as, as they can be is, uh, is critically important, even in this uh, environment we're finding ourselves in. Yeah, great example, Mark. And, and, and I, I build on that. We're also using the, the kind of HoloLens technology and, and increasingly using remote collaboration. So, you know, help to support our operations and additional technical support to, to ensure that we could do that that safely. You know, Richard was involved in a lot of that when he was at BP and, and helped put that in place. We've expanded that to our operations uh, as well. So, again, global collaborative centers where we're having people in offices in locations like Houston and London and, and, and even places like Azerbaijan and, and India that can provide support to the teams offshore 
without physically being there, which is fantastic. The other two examples I'd give would be on the, the drill floor of rigs. So taking people out of harm's way, out of the, the red zone, and as we call it, which is a place where uh, people you know often can get hurt. And that's through automation of, of the actual drilling activity and also through you know better management of, of people being in, in places where they could be harmed. And I think that's made a huge difference. The last example I'll give is on the integrity of the facilities. I mentioned that many of them are aging and it really is a lot of work and effort to bring people offshore to inspect the facilities and see what the condition is and then to paint and, and repair. And the more we can do that with robots and crawlers um, and drones, uh, the more efficient we'll be and the better a chance we'll have of, of again, making sure that um, those facilities are in the absolute best shape that they can be in. Great, thank you. Uh, I can jump in here, Jim, if you don't mind, just real quickly, you know, one of the things I, I would say from an equipment provider's perspective that we've done is number one, you know, can we design equipment that doesn't require personnel on the rig and in the red zone? That's key and foremost. And, and you know, we've had some success in that area. Uh, and the secondly really is on the validation testing. You know, one of the things, and, and you you know that very well, is, I, I tell our engineers, I want to know what it that it does what it says on the box, right? If we claim something, I want to prove that. And and uh, we we spend a lot of time and energy, you know, testing fully. You know, I mean, we've tested full wellhead systems. We fatigue tested wellhead systems and wellhead connectors. And, and all of those things are done to uh, to improve the safety and reduce the risk um for for the personnel offshore the risk of the environment I, I think it's just really important that we you know that we've tested this equipment um exactly how it's going to be used and that and that's really what we do at drill clip thanks blake um here's a big question oil and gas industry has been more effective than other industries due to the pandemic do you anticipate a recovery to the pre-pandemic levels at any at some point anytime soon I think you ought to bring James West in for to answer that one. <laughs> That's what I think. Well, I, you know, I'll jump in here. I'm glad to hear. I'm sorry, what was the question, Jim? There you go. <laughs> yeah, so so the question is, and, and Richard had the floor, the oil and gas industry has been more effective than other industries due to the pandemic. Do you anticipate a recovery to the pre-pandemic levels at some point? So we'll, we'll let Richard go first, and James, sure. you can jump in right after yeah, I think I give you the uh, IEA punchline a little earlier. They're saying they're seeing a recovery now in 2025, so a little longer. But it, it's, uh, you know, what's unprecedented about this, we've got both a supply and a demand issue at the same time. And it's and it's unprecedented. And it's in the COVID, COVID-19 is a part of that equation because of the shutdown it's had in the, in the travel industry and some of the large transportation and other elements. But... Uh, Look, I know we've got James as an expert, so I'm going to tell talking about things that I read about. James, you're the, you're a leader in this, so why don't you go ahead and jump in there and give us your thoughts? So. Yeah, so I, you know, a couple of things. So unfortunately, uh, Starley, I'm going to disagree with the BP view that uh, old man is has, has peaked or is near peak. Um, we see you know oil being a huge part of the mix uh, going forward, oil and natural gas being part of the mix, even during the transition as the global economy recovers from the, the COVID-19 crisis and the massive amounts, I think we have over 600 now stimulus efforts that, have, that are underway to get the economy restarted and, and going again, it's gonna drive demand uh, pretty quickly. I mean, we see economic growth in kind of 21 after we get past the, the, the COVID V-shaped recovery back after this year, of five plus percent and then probably supercharged still of that five percent range in 22 which will bring us by the end of 21 most likely back to 100 million barrels a day and then should take that to you know 102 by the end of 22 and then maybe we go back to one one and a half percent growth uh in oil demand at that point for the next several decades all right great thank you uh Danny, there is a question for you. You said uh, you mentioned that subsea multiphase pumping could help to bring the cost down in the Gulf of Mexico. Could you elaborate a little bit more on this? Well, if you think about uh, multiple type 
operations. You know, if, if you don't need to uh, bring all of these tiebacks back to the facility, you can bring them to uh, some subsea manifold where you can have several tiebacks instead of multiple tiebacks to the same platform. And obviously, there's a savings, and you have a, a main pumping station. That, I would say that that's probably one of the major benefits of the, of the multi phase pumping is the ability to pump multiple fields. Okay. Thanks, David. Uh, another question is, what are the prospects of an industry funding R&D in non-traditional flow assurance technologies, many of which have remained at bench scale despite having promising results that could be scaled up? If, if anybody can chime in in that question. I mean, I can come in. I think, I think industry will continue to fund R&D. I, I think we are as we talked about earlier in this call, you know, capital and 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 kind of um, you know overall funding for anything is, is increasingly constrained, and so I think we just need to be very efficient in the way that we screen and develop those technologies, and you know we have things we can learn from the software industry around, you know, rather than coming in with big projects that cost you know millions and billions of dollars to develop technology. You know, is there a minimal viable product that we can test and then really evaluate whether or not we think it's effective and then think about scale. Uh, but we need to, to be efficient and to use our money wisely. We need to have great ideas, but we also need to fail fast and, and move on when things don't work. Great, thank you, Starley. Starley, uh, I might jump in there too. I think too that there's some, currently there's a bunch of new thinking around nanotechnologies and in particular on coatings of, of pipe and surfaces that could radically change not only the uh, if you will, the, the coefficients of friction, but also could greatly improve the design life or corrosion resistance in those uh, in those tubes. And, and that makes a huge difference in a life of field activity set. And uh, we're, you know, we're just starting to toy and look at those, but the, as uh, several people have mentioned, the, the significance of this is being agile enough to be able to trial and to pilot and to get to a proof point so you can take these kind of things forward. And, uh, you know, and, it, and, it, and the great news is you can do it on the onshore and then take it to the offshore where the, uh, where the stakes are a little bit higher, if you will, but there's great opportunities to do that as you move forward in the technology front. Thank you, Richard. Um, another question, we touched a little bit on this, but uh, maybe you can elaborate a little bit more. And uh, if possible, I'd like to hear from both the operators and the uh, the manufacturing side. With energy transition dynamics, what efforts are the operators making uh, to minimize carbon footprint offshore? I, I can go ahead and start if you like. Uh, it's a great question. And I think it's important first and foremost to realize or understand that in the offshore environment, especially in the Gulf of Mexico that I'm most familiar with, the carbon footprint per barrel or the carbon emitted per barrel is actually relatively low to other asset classes. So it's uh, it's, uh, it's it's got that going for it. And in terms of uh, after you acknowledge that, what are we doing to make it even lower? And I think uh, we're, we're all doing our part there. I give a great example just this last week. Uh, we, we got back on shore or offshore uh, after we had evacuated from Hurricane Delta starting up our facilities and uh first off you know we didn't have any damage from at our facilities so we were uh, getting ready to start up our, our our production back up and uh some of our gas export lines were not available some of the gas plants on shore not across the board but a couple of them weren't ready to receive production yet and so where we uh where we had an option to go ahead and flow and and basically flare the gas for a few days which maybe in days past we would have made that choice we chose not to and so uh waiting until um, those facilities were live even though it was regulatory okay to do so we, we chose to uh, to do that so it's it's a lot of little things that we have to do in every everything that we do starting with the design of our assets and uh and then the, the footprint we have offshore and the amount of equipment we did i thought there's a great example there in guyana just to on the, the well density. So you have to be very thoughtful on, on the whole thing. Yeah, I'd like to build on that, Mark. I think you made some great points and I think there's kind of you know, three sides to it. One is the, the, the operations we already have that are there and in place. 
you know, they were built in a, in a previous time and how do we make them better? And, and as Mark says, I think it's focusing on things like flaring, uh, power generation and logistics. And then we've got efforts in all those areas to, to reduce the amount we emit. And then I think it's the new facilities and there'll be, you know, step changes as we go. We've got our Mad Dog Phase 2 facility uh, that um, Mark's actually a partner with that's going to be coming out um, shortly. And it's got increased technology to be help be it more efficient and reduce emissions. And then I think there's some game changing stuff that I touched on earlier, which would be the things like low par or carbon uh, low carbon power from shore or um, or other ideas that could um, like enhanced oil recovery that could really help reduce the footprint. But I think we have to face it. And just to make one comment on James, actually BP does believe the demand will continue to increase for energy. I think for us, it's just about, you know, how do we produce the hydrocarbon that will need to be produced and that the world needs? How do we do it in the best possible way? Uh, thanks. Thanks, Tony. Uh, anybody else? Any comments on this? Okay, uh, I think uh, we're, we're coming close to the end here. I'll ask one more last question. Um, and this is for anybody on the panel. Uh, do you anticipate significant changes in the regulatory in environment in the coming years? I, I can go ahead and start uh, on that one. And uh, so regulatory environments change over time. And we've seen change over the last uh, 80 plus years that we've been actually working in the Gulf of Mexico. And, uh, you know, Chevron's belief is regulations are not a bad thing. They're a good thing. They help us all work safely and uh, in a very environmental uh, uh, conscious way. And so uh, the fact and that we've talked a little bit about the demand for oil and gas, that there's going to be a need for oil and gas for, for quite some time yet to come. And uh, having having some oil and gas uh, operations domestically is actually a strategic benefit uh, to the U.S. in many people's eyes, uh, having that reliable energy source. So I think what we're all going to do is just be committed to work with uh, with whatever administration is there, and uh, and prove that uh, that we can do this in a lower carbon manner that we talked about in the last question. And, and also in a very environmentally friendly um, way to, uh, to help supply the fuel that the, all the growing economies need. Thank you, Mark. And uh, with that, I think uh, we're going to wrap the session here. And once again, I want to thank the host and all panelists for this great discussion. And I, I think we all can agree that we feel a little bit better in a sense, or at least we've got some, some questions answered, you know, uh, the reality is the reality. The pandemic is doing what 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 is doing right now, but we still have adjusted. And I want to thank OTC for organizing this and being able to actually have such a great discussion. Uh, I want to thank the audience. Uh, I know you probably can't see that, but uh, there there are close to 500 people on the audience, wow. and there are about over a dozen countries all over the world. Uh, and I want to thank you for being part of this. Uh, and I hope the next year things will change. And I hope to be in person, to be where we can shake each other's hand and, and talk closely. But nevertheless, we've proven that we we are resilient, that we can adjust, and this is this is proof today. So so with that, I want to wish everybody on behalf of OTC all the best and please be safe out there. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Guys.